And I, that I got kissed the day before yesterday by President Shimon Peres, and that I have not washed my face since. <laughs> so, but I did the book um, about the dangers of the internet and the importance of parents to be aware of what their young people are putting on the internet. Young people don't realize they put a naked picture of themselves, they think they could retrieve it, or they hate somebody. As you know, young people, one day they hate, the next day they love somebody, and they think that they can change that. And the other thing is, if they cheated on a test, they put it with kind of bravado on the uh, internet, thinking also they can get it back. Later on, when they go for a job, somebody has, that they cheated, somebody that they didn't, and as you all know, who is going to get the job. But more importantly, lately, I'm very sad, because I live in Washington Heights, same apartment, uh, overlooking the Hudson and the George Washington Bridge for 50 years, and I'm very saddened because a couple of uh, months ago, a young student from Rutgers, it wasn't his only problem. I'm not uh, naive to think that was his only problem. But he was in, uh, at uh, Rutgers University having a sexual encounter with an older man, a homosexual sexual encounter. Somebody, as a joke, filmed it from the room next door put it on the internet, and the young man jumped from that George Washington Bridge. So I promised myself, any place I talk, I'm saying to parents, to grandparents, to whoever it is, we have to take that issue of the internet very seriously. I know that children sometimes give their addresses. Sometimes they even meet with somebody. They don't know that that's somebody who has bad intentions. And I, one of the things say, which is difficult to do, to, um, there is some mechanism, and I can't explain it. You have all of these computer people here, that you might block certain things. I tell you what happened in another case. Parents had a DVD player, and the two of them, something that I would advise, before engaging in any, any sexual encounter, they watched some sexually explicit movie on their DVD player. I, might, I probably think they got so carried away, they got so aroused, they forgot that there was one DVD left in the player. And the youngster, of course, found it. So one of the things at this stage in my life as a sex educator and a sex therapist I always have said that my children's sex life is not my business. And my sex life, um, now that I'm a widow, or even before, of course, uh, is not none of their business, but that part is uh, changing as we speak. For example, if kids brag, that's what young people do. Uh, that they are engaging in oral sex, that they are engaging in hooking up. Uh, very sad, because I want people, whenever they decide to be sexually active, depending on their morals, depending on their religious background, depending on when their inner voice tells them, I don't want them to say that publicly, and I also don't want them to engage in any activity just because they don't want to be lonely on a Saturday night. In the States, where I live, so I know most about the States, very sad. Young people don't have a place to congregate, except if they belong to some, to no, no wife, they belong to a youth movement, because parents don't want teenagers in the house or in the apartment. They want a little privacy. But the other problem is that teenagers get to bed so late so by the time the parents wait to have some sex, 
so that finally the kids are in bed, they are too tired. <laughs> so we, have, we don't have schools and moadonim and places open uh, where there are activities. Uh, even my Y, I the, was the president for 12 years, is closed on Friday evenings. The school next door to me has a swimming pool. It is closed on weekends. So really young people don't have a place to go. And now it's becoming even more dangerous because now at least they go and they talk to whatever it's called friends, which I think is a big problem. I would rather that they say acquaintances or um, something that might develop into friendships, but they talk about very intimate things on the internet just to have something to talk about. First of all, I do believe that um, my uh, parents' sex life is their business and their youngster's sex life is their business. Uh, Saul Gordon, a famous uh, sex educator in the States, he was at Syracuse University, he coined a wonderful term, to be an askable parent. I didn't coin the term, but I use it every day. To be an askable parent means that that youngster has to know that they can ask somebody, can be a grandmother, can be an aunt, a question or can say, get me a book. But I know that today it's so much easier for them to get on that uh, internet and that's why I'm sounding that uh, very uh, kind of a bell of alarm. There's something uh, in the States of fashion. Uh, my granddaughter, don't tell her that I'm telling you that. She's 15, but she thinks she's 25. <laughs> yeah, but don't, don't tell her that. And I do not really talk about, this is not my function. This is her parents' function, my daughter or my son in Ottawa. But there is some fashion right now. First of all, in my way of thinking, young girls and now also young boys dress inappropriately to go to the mall, for example. They dress, the young boy, you can see the erection. The young girl dresses so provocatively that you can see almost her whole body, a little bit of imagination. And I'm saying a catastrophe. Here is this little grandmother, 83 years old, talking about orgasms and erections from morning to night. And now I'm talking about the obligation on a parent to say, you cannot go out dressed like this. Now, I'm not saying that a youngster is not going to take their clothes, put it in a package, change in the bathroom or the mall. That might be. However, the tone is clear. As long as you live in my house, you have to dress appropriately. Because I don't want to hear more about sexual harassment I certainly don't want to hear more about rape and other things. I also, and many people do not agree with me, I do believe as much as how open I think that a couple, once the relationship is established, has to be able to talk or to show or to teach about what they need, I also believe that there has to be that part that should be not discussed. For example, uh, here, here's a, a couple deciding to have sex. They're over age 18. They have made the decision. I don't want her to say to him, my last lover had a bigger penis, because I can promise you he's going to lose his erection. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want him to say the last girl's friend had bigger breast. And uh, so there has to be that kind of line um, that, that, that people have to learn about what not to say. Um, in, you know that in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud it says that a lesson taught with humor is a lesson retained. I could never tell you a joke. I hear jokes every day that go in one ear and out the other. However, I never permitted my late husband, he passed away 15 years ago, to come to any of my talks. Because when I would ask for questions, he would sit here. 
he would raise his hand. I wouldn't be able to ignore him. He would tell all of you, don't listen to her, it's all talk. <laughs> and Fred Westheimer loved Diane Sawyer. When she came to my apartment, Washington Nights, with 60 minutes, I did not have the heart to say, Fred, you can't be home. <laughs> Here we are sitting down, the cameras are rolling, and Diane Sawyer, the first question, she says, Mr. Westheimer, how is your sex life? <laughs> to which Fred said the shoemaker's children don't have shoes. <laughs> and that's what I want sexuality education uh, to be like. Sex, um, sex uh, um, horror stories don't work. Uh, you are all too young. But during World War II, uh, they told American soldiers, they showed them movies of syphilis, of uh, horror movies, and hoping that that would deter them from engaging in any sexual activity. That worked for 48 hours, because the libido is very strong, and after 48 hours, they said, like many young people, nothing is going to happen.